WVW Broadcast Network is pleased to present National Security Meltdown with host Philip Haney. As the author of See Something, Say Nothing, Philip is recognized as a credible national security expert and frequent guest host on national radio and television broadcasts, as well as a much sought after keynote speaker. Philip is a charter member of the Department of Homeland Security with previous experience in the Middle East. As a DHS frontline officer and intelligence expert, Philip bravely tried to say something about the people and organizations that threatened the United States. Yet, his intelligence information was eliminated from the government database, and he was investigated during the Obama administration by the very agency assigned to protect the country. Through this broadcast, Philip will expose just how deeply the submission, denial, and deception run within our national intelligence agencies. Philip's years of being an insider allowed him to be an eyewitness to the federal government's capitulating to an enemy within and punishing those who reject the narrative of the deep state. Such dereliction of duty has led to a national security meltdown. And now, here is your host, Philip Haney. Hello, everyone. Continuing on with our series on the national security meltdown, we're going to talk about the northern border, meaning the border with Canada and the United States. And let me mention that I'm coming to you today as with the perspective of a law enforcement officer. So imagine sitting at an airport or a port of entry with foreign travelers coming in from Canada uh, with the knowledge that the rules for entry in Canada are different than the rules for entry in America. What I mean by that is that Canada allows people to come into their country that we might not. So, if you have an individual, for example, that's uh, the leader of a globally designated terrorist organization and is well known to be preaching jihad and Islamic implementation of sh Islamic Sharia, if we wouldn't let him into America, but they let him into Canada, here's what happens. You have people that live here in the United States that cross over the border and go to meetings that are where these individuals are speaking and then come back home across the border again back to their communities in Buffalo and Detroit and Columbus, Ohio and Los Angeles and around the country. So what Canada does and what its counterterrorism policies might be have a direct bearing on uh, our efforts to secure our borders here in the United States. So we're going to look at the northern border today and we'll start out with a provision that's gained a lot of attention up there in Canada. It's called M103. It's a systematic, systemic racism and religious discrimination bill. Essentially, it's attempting to criminalize what is known as Islamophobia or criticism of Islam. And after a lot of debate from December 1st of 2016 through March 23rd of 2017, it passed. See, here's the headline from March in 2017. Anti-Islamophobia motion easily passes House of Commons. Well, why is this important? Because people in Canada are being pushed into a corner regarding freedom of speech and facing criminal charges, much like in the UK these days, if they criticize Islam or they attempt to point out the nature of the threat that some of these groups that are operating in Canada that are Islamic in nature might pose to the sovereignty and security of their country, let alone the sovereignty and security of us here in America. And now I remember the point that I was trying to make earlier. Would you like to guess what percentage of the northern border is actually secure? Well, it's five, five percent. It's virtually wide open. So if Canada has a different approach to counterterrorism and national sovereignty than America does, and that only 5% is secure, meaning 95% of it is really wide open, 
then I would suggest that that poses a threat. And in order to prove that point, you'll see a slide or two later that shows that there's actually active human trafficking going on from Canada into the United States. We hear an awful lot about the southern border. We hear much less about the northern border, but it's also a threat to our sovereignty as well. And meanwhile, this headline from October of 17, Liberals left reeling by clear, rational criticisms of M103. The same thing is happening right now in the U.S. Congress over the issue of anti-Semitism with comments by Ilan Omar and Rashida Talib. They're debating right now whether to censor them. Well, the left is reeling because it's created a huge fracture within their party and the leaders, Nancy Pelosi in particular, doesn't really know how to handle it because she doesn't want to alienate the far left wing of her party and yet she knows full well that the majority of Americans are not going to tolerate members of Congress, Congress making openly anti-Semitic comments. Well, the same thing is going, up, going on up in Canada. In this case, it has to do with freedom of speech, the right to criticize what people see as a threat, i.e. the implementation of Sharia law and much more open immigration policy than what we have here. Far from the slam dunk feel good gesture it was meant to be, M103 is looking more and more like a pivotal political and cultural moment in Canadian history and it is. Sometimes history sneaks up on you and it happens right in front of you before you realize it and sometimes it's a small incident that will set it off. A few comments by a couple of members of Congress here in America or a comment by the governor of Virginia about uh, abortion set off huge firestorms of debate, political debate, within the Democratic Party, both at the national level and at the state level in Virginia. Same kind of thing. So what it's really doing is putting tension on our whole political structure because we've never had to deal with such blatant violations of the sanctity of life or such blatant intrusions by a supremacy ideology that insists that it is superior to every other man-made form of law, meaning Sharia. So we do have a terrorist threat on the northern border. There is an Islamic influence within the Canadian government that is very strong and it's becoming more and more a concern to the citizens of that country. Is it so severe that it's becoming a national security threat to the U.S.? Well, as a, as a retired CBP officer, I can say yes, it does. But I should also add that we do cooperate closely with our colleagues in Canada, but nonetheless, having different standards of admission between Canada and America has an inherent problem. They allow people to come in that we would not allow that may be on our terrorist watch list but are not on the equivalent watch list up there in Canada. And then you combine that with a pretty much open border and it's a, it's a wide open possibility that some bad things are going to happen in the future. And political Islam is threatening North America just like in Europe it's happening more and more here in North America. Canadian Sunni Islamists pose a special threat to Canada, it says, according to a leaked Canadian Security Intelligence Service report. Kind of similar to the agency I used to work at it at the National Targeting Center outside of Washington. The service has never before, never before faced a terrorist threat of this scope. So it sounds just like Europe, which we reviewed earlier. This problem is starting to get out of hand and they don't really know what, how to deal with it. Actually, they should know how to deal with it. It's just that they don't have the political wherewithal or the permission from the hierarchy of, of the government to actually implement and enforce the laws that already exist in their country. Terrorist threat of the scope, scale and complexity of the Sunni Islamist inspired terrorism noted the 2016 document. So even though this story came out in 2018, it's actually been known now for about three years 
that Canada is facing an increasingly dangerous situation vis-a-vis -vis jihad terrorism in their own country. And of course, that bleeds over into America. Here's a report that they published called Taking Action Against Systemic Racism and Religious Discrimination, Including Islamophobia. And so here's the same paradox in Canada that we face here. The same dilemma that I saw as an active duty law enforcement officer, where on the hand, one hand you have irrefutable proof of a growing trend of individuals and organizations that are pushing forward this global agenda and are willing to use terrorism as part of one of the tactics to do it, on the one hand. And on the other hand, these endless debates within the political social arena on how are they going to solve the problems of Islamophobia and uh, discrimination and racism. So here we have the same dynamic going on in Canada. So far, the debate has been, has been won by the social political side. I don't really know how, what it's going to take for us to push the reset button where we get to the point where law enforcement is actually allowed to do their job. And I say that from the experience of being a founding member of the department. And as I mentioned earlier, from March of 2003 when the agency was first created and founded through about the third year into about the middle of 2006, we actually were able to do our job. So I know from experience what it was like and that it is possible. And then I saw the gradual erosion of our capacity as law enforcement officers to do our job. And it led us right up to the point where we have these kind of documents where they're wringing their hands trying to understand what exactly to do about the threat of Islamophobia rather than the threat of actual terrorism. So the previous slide is the law enforcement perspective stating plainly their concern and their worry about the rising threat of jihad in Canada versus in the social political arena where they're concerned about the outbreak of Islamophobia. So one of these attitude or positions is going to have to prevail and I would say it has to be the law enforcement if we want to preserve, in America's case, our constitutional republic, or if they want to preserve their heritage, as they call it up in Canada. The implosion of Canada's M103 conspiracy theories. So basically, my point in bringing all this up is this bill, 103, attempting to outlaw criticism of Islam and label it as racist Islamophobia has set off a huge cultural and political debate within Canada which is still going on to this day and it remains to see remains to be seen what side of the of the fence this debate is going to end up on here's one more document government response to the 10th report of the standing committee on Canadian heritage entitled taking action against systemic racism and religious discrimination, including Islamophobia. In other words, they seem to be more concerned about that than they are the actual threat of uh, the ideology, the theology generated out of the Quran and the Hadith that gives Muslims, Salafi Muslims, pro-Jihad Muslims, the right and calling and duty to undermine and subvert the governments of non-Islamic countries in order to soften up the ground to implement Sharia law. Now they have a big job obviously, but they're bound and determined that they're going to keep going and, and do all that they can. Rather than assimilate and become citizens under the form of government of their host country or their country that they immigrate to, both Canada and America, they refuse to assimilate and rather create communities which are Sharia compliant and just like a tree growing under a sidewalk eventually grow enough to break the concrete of the sidewalk. And that's kind of the process that's going on. So Department of Homeland Security is concerned about it and they actually issued a report called the Northern Border Strategy back in June of 2018 which is what not quite even a year yet. And here 
is one of the excerpts from it. In 2017, GHS conducted an assessment of the northern border and concluded that while the northern border remains an area of limited threat in comparison to the southern border, safeguarding and securing the northern border represents unique challenges. The most common threat to the U.S. public safety along the northern border continues to be bi-directional flow of drugs. So now we're not even talking about trafficking or terrorism. The other threat is drugs coming in. Transnational criminal organizations along the border adapt their drug production and smuggling methods and routes to avoid detention by the U.S. and Canadian law enforcement. Well, the drug smugglers can do it, then so can terrorists, right? And human traffickers. Potential terror threats are primarily from homegrown violent extremism. Well, there's that word again, homegrown violent extremists. What is that exactly? Where do these seeds come from? These seeds that are planted and grown in a home garden, where do they actually come from? And that's the part that as a law enforcement officer irritates me, that we keep hearing these phrases, these euphemisms inserted into uh, official government documents. We don't really know what it is. We just call it homegrown violent extremism. Potential terror threats from violent extremists in Canada who are not included in the U.S. government's consolidated terrorist watch list. That's what I told you about before. This is a more official language, but it's saying the same thing that I told you, that Canada admits people to come into their country that we don't allow to come into our country. So we have a disconnect there, and it can, it can be a very serious problem. People that we know about operating up there, we, they don't necessarily even notify us when they come into the country. We do find out about it sometimes when American citizens cross the border and we may interview them when they come back into America and find out that they went to some sort of a meeting up in Toronto or Ottawa where one of these individuals was speaking. That's kind of what, how we find things out. It's called intelligence. Amid focus on immigration from the south, illegal crossings from Canada surge. I mentioned earlier that there's a trend developing of human trafficking and e illegal immigration coming in from the north, and here's proof of it. A lot of these little border stations are barely just a tiny little building, and then there's many hundreds possibly of miles where there's no border protection at all. Illegal immigration, human smuggling at the northern border. While the Trump administration fortifies the southern border, there's a growing concern over the number of foreigners entering the country illegally across the porous northern border with Canada. And it says here they charge them up to $4,000. That's cheap compared to the southern, which is usually three or four times that. It's incredible the amount of money that human traffickers make off the misery of other people, usually payable when the immigrants reach their U.S. destination. So that means there's networks on both sides of the border, both in Canada and America, that are, that are profiting from this flow back and forth in Canada and America. So if I was a law enforcement officer trying to break the cycle of human smuggling, I would track down where these centers of operation in cities across the country and focus on them. That's the organization. You break that network and it shuts down the whole network. That's how you do law enforcement. They are well organized. They have scouted the area. They have scouted us, meaning CBP. They know what our routines is and they just work around it. Basically, we are not dealing with the JT, JV team. This is the varsity team. Well, these guys have gained plenty of experience smuggling people all over the world. How do you suppose the people from, the, from countries like Syria and Iraq transit all the way through to Turkey, go across the Bosporus Straits into continental Europe? Do you think they do it all by themselves? No. Every step along the way, somebody has their hand out for money. Where do their documents come from? Their passports, their visas. It's an incredibly well-organized and very, very lucrative, but also obscenely dangerous profession. It's happening over there, and it's also happening here in North America. 
Meanwhile, we have the founder of the Islamic Party of Ontario. These are Salafi. And he's condemning a man named Tariq Fatah. He is a Muslim who is speaking about, out about the emerging threat of the implementation of Sharia law in Canada. And he called him an open enemy of Islam. Well, that's, that's essentially a fatwa. That can lead to his death. Like Salman Rushdie and so many other people. I'm an Ali Hirsali who speak out against Islam and then put, have a target put on them. Even Tommy Robinson, people here in the United States as well. It's, it's, a, it's a reality. So if he speaks out about the fact that Islam is a threat, you have these Salafi pro-Jihad, pro-Sharia Muslims that are openly calling him an enemy of Islam. Well, that's veiled language for that's a capital offense. That's a violation of Sharia law. They say that he is a Pakistani agent planted in India with anti-Islam and anti-Pakistani facial cover-up. So, it's always a conspiracy theory. Rather than facing the reality of what they and admit what they had intend to do, they blame others for bringing it to the, to the attention of the general public. So to be in this field, it takes a lot of courage. That's really the bottom line. If you're going to speak out about the growing influence of Islam around the world, you better be really sure uh, where you stand and what you believe and have the courage to, uh, to, to recognize that you're, you may well put your life at threat, both economically, socially, in your work, in your profession, and or even up to and including your actual life. Now this is uh, Trudeau. Canada is set to sign on to the UN Migration Pact. Here's what you need to know. Um, I mentioned this earlier. This is a UN driven effort to standardize the migration, immigration policies of the entire world at the expense of the sovereignty of the individual countries. The United States has not signed it. President Trump does not intend to sign it. But Prime Minister Trudeau does intend to sign it. And this is just showing up this disconnect. You have people coming into Canada that we would not admit here, who then get established and can easily cross the border to come into America, just like they do in the southern border, and put us at greater risk. So this is something to be aware of and to pay attention because it's going to be developing in the next few weeks and months. As I said earlier, if I come back in a month, I'd probably be able to add this many more slides to the, each one of these presentations because every one of the topics that I've pre chosen to present in this series are what I call live stories. I'm not providing analysis, retroactive analysis of things that happened months and years ago and we're just kind of debating them like a history subject. These are things that are actually going on in real time as we speak right now. And this is just a basic introduction. I call it water skiing. You get out there on the water, but what some of you will want to do is like stop the boat, put on your scuba gear, and dive down into the water and you're going to discover that there's a whole lot of really big fish way down there and some of them have very sharp teeth on them so don't be surprised if you start to uh, get more involved in some of these subjects that you're going to be overwhelmed by the reality of how serious each one of these areas is in terms of our national security and you'll understand better and better while I call it a national security meltdown. The Islamic Party of Ontario. Islam is the native dean of Ontario and Canada. Dean means religion, but it also means law. So now these Salafi Muslims that immigrated to Canada are turning around and saying that Islam is the original native language of Canada. Not language, native religion of Canada. The Islamic Party of Ontario, a new political party, says that uh, in their principles and policies that uh, Islam is the natural religion 
That means Sharia law is the natural law of Canada. And they're trying to normalize it. Well, you say, well, that couldn't happen. Well, look how we have tried to normalize, not try, we are normalizing abortion. Now it's up to the point of infanticide. And it's the same way. It happens the same way. And that's why I started the series out with abortion. Because if we normalize the killing of our own children, we're basically willing, capable of normalizing virtually anything, including the implementation of Sharia law under the umbrella of diversity and inclusion and, and that all uh, forms of religion and practices of faith are equal and compatible. Well, they're not because Islam itself says, even this statement here is a supremacy statement. It's saying that Islam is superior to anything that came before Islam arrived in Canada. And here's another illustration. Islamic Party of Canada, clean public education from sexual perversion and liberal ideologies. Basically, the things that progressive leftists and liberals are so proud to defend, diversity and inclusion, gay rights, LGBTQT, and so on, Islam is adamantly opposed to it. And if they ever achieve a majority influence in any political system, they will, they will start to uh, cut back the rights of these groups like the gay community and so on, and or liberal ideologies. They're going after the progressive leftist ideology of a majority of people in that, uh, on the left. And I've already mentioned this already, Islamophobia and the Muslim Brotherhood of Canada. The Muslim Brotherhood is a driving gravitational force behind a lot of these efforts, not only in Canada, but here in the United States. And as I mentioned, they're like uniforms, football players. A professional quarterback one day can have a red uniform on. He can be, tra he can be traded to another team and put a blue uniform on, go through a few scrimmage practices with his new team, and he's good to go because he's a professional quarterback. And it's the same way with the Muslim Brotherhood. They adapt, they take the shape of a glass like water. Whatever glass they're in, that's the shape they take. And they will either go under, around, th or through an object until they prevail. Andrew Shear calls on Trudeau to resign in wake of Wilson Raybould SNC Lavalin testimony. So Another variable in this equation that's going on right now is whether Trudeau will even survive as Prime Minister of Canada. And if he doesn't, if he's replaced or resigns, then the question will be, will he be replaced with a more conservative form of government that will address some of these emerging threats of the Salafi Muslim political parties operating in Canada just like they operate in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh and India and Afghanistan and so many other places in the world. The Muslim Brotherhood there in Egypt, for example. So we're coming to the conclusion of this particular presentation on the northern border. And it's an introduction. There is much more, obviously, that could be said about this. But my main encouragement is just... Keep your ears open and your eyes open as you read through the web or listen to the radio or the watch news on TV and you will hear. Suddenly you'll notice, maybe that where you didn't notice before, there'll be a headline story about something that's going on in Canada that'll catch your attention, whereas maybe before it didn't because of this short introduction to the emerging threat on the northern border. So, along with you, I will pledge to stand up for our constitutional republic and pledge to defend the Constitution and this government of, for, and by the people in such a time as this. So thank you very much. WVW Broadcast Network is pleased to present National Security Meltdown with host Philip Haney. As the author of See Something, Say Nothing, Philip is recognized as a credible national security expert 
and frequent guest host on national radio and television broadcasts, as well as a much sought after keynote speaker. Philip is a charter member of the Department of Homeland Security with previous experience in the Middle East. As a DHS frontline officer and intelligence expert, Philip bravely tried to say something about the people and organizations that threatened the United States. Yet, his intelligence information was eliminated from the government database and he was investigated during the Obama administration by the very agency assigned to protect the country. Through this broadcast, Philip will expose just how deeply the submission, denial, and deception run within our national intelligence agencies. Philip's years of being an insider allowed him to be an eyewitness to the federal government's capitulating to an enemy within and punishing those who reject the narrative of the deep state. Such dereliction of duty has led to a national security meltdown. And now, here is your host, Philip Haney.